You folks have had a pretty full day already. I'll uh, try and keep this uh, as, how do I want to put it, informative as possible without getting too dry. When you start getting into micronutrients, you can get heavily into chemistry, and I'm actually a chemist by training. So that kind of stuff's really neat for me. But I found that other people don't share my passion for it. When you start throwing up structural diagrams of a complex organic molecule, a lot of people just kind of fog over and say, why am I here? So I'll try and keep my own enthusiasm in check. Um, as I said, my name's John McGillicuddy. My partner, Karen Corrigan, and I are independent agronomists. To define that, we do not make any money based on product sales. We do not endorse. We have 130 some farm clients and we try to help them answer the questions that matter to them most. There's always questions that we can spend time answering, but do they actually change your outcome? And so we tend to focus on the questions that are actually gonna change the outcome. Um, we try to do it in a little different pattern. You can hire somebody, they'll come out on your fields every year and answer the same question over and over again for a fee. Our business is based on teaching you how to answer those questions yourself. What do you see? How do you read it? How do you react to it? And really what it comes down to is how do you pick the right dragon to slay? You go out in a field, you got two to three yield limiting factors that you can identify. You have to pick out the ones that are the most important. There can be a hundred things in a field that can reduce your yield. You can't chase them all. You got to pick out the most likely ones. And the PhD that I trained under put it this way. He said, you got to pick which dragon to kill first. You're in a room, there's five dragons in that room. You have to kill the one that's most likely to get you because if you don't, you're not around to bother with the other four. So you've got to set your priorities in this game. We tend to do it from a very unemotional standpoint. It's about making money. You've got limited resources to invest in a crop. You have to put those in the places where they're going to give you the highest return. You should do it without emotion or without too much worry. Just do it. Because if you continue to do that, if you put your resources where they're going to generate the highest return quickest, You'll have more at the end of the year to solve more problems. So that's kind of how we play the game. Um, I guess the best way to describe our business is to try and help you to be your own best agronomist. We believe in a couple things, but one of them is you'll always be your own best source of agronomic support because you're there every day and it's your money on the line. That makes you a much more dedicated observer. Did you ever notice that? I hear people all the time, they hire employees and they say, I just want them to treat it like they own it. Well, they don't. You own it, so you're going to treat it like you own it. It's really hard to get somebody that doesn't own something to treat it like they own it. How much money have you spent washing rented cars in your life? <laughs> you don't. So you're going to be your own best agronomist. You're going to be your own best observer or your own most dedicated observer. Now today we're going to talk about managing induced micronutrient deficiencies in soybeans. There's a couple areas I want to focus on and then we'll open up to questions. The rule number one with micronutrients is it's not easy money. You can make money with micronutrients, but it's never easy money. Our rule in micronutrients is before you invest a lot of money, you do a lot of homework. And one of the things you have to decide is, first of all, are you deficient? Sometimes that's not as easy as you think. And the second one is why? You can have a lot of micronutrient deficiencies in a field in Illinois that that soil test for that particular micronutrient is actually more than adequate. The question is, is it giving up the nutrient? Is it giving, you up, giving it up when you need it? Or is something getting in its way? And there's a few things we're going to focus on, but uh, we follow some rules. And for some of you, the, there is a handout of some of my slides in the back if some of you picked them up on the way in. Two rules in crop production that will never let you down. Rule number one, almost anything will work somewhere. We have looked at some of the most off-the-wall things you can imagine, and every now and again they work. We're not really sure why. I think the only total failure we had, there was a guy up north that was selling pregnant dairy cow urine in a barrel. <laughs> and that was uh, going to increase your yields. And there were some questions I had, which one of them was, once the urine's in the barrel, how do you determine that the cow was in fact pregnant? I had struggle with that one. But the other one was, if you need a salesman, this was your guy. <laughs> Unfortunately, almost anything will work somewhere. Problem number two, absolutely nothing works everywhere. And that leads us to rules three and four. Spending money on anything will not improve your yields unless these two things are true. The problem you're solving exists in your field, and that particular problem sets your, the ceiling on your yield. You can fix a whole lot of things that were actually good things to fix, but didn't change the outcome. 
The other philosophy we follow, start with the simplest solutions and the simplest explanations. You can complicate things as much as you want. Uh, I've learned a lot of scientific principles and a lot of scientific laws and a lot of theorems in my education and career. And the most important one is one called Occam's Razor. Are you familiar with that? It's an entire paragraph and I could have simplified it for him because you can take it down to one sentence. The simplest answer is usually the correct one. Now there's a medical version of that. When you see hoof prints, start looking for horses first. Don't go to zebras right away. Okay? <laughs> Look for the simple answer. Now, one of the areas we're going to talk about today is glyphosate. Glyphosate's a herbicide. There's some arguments that it's binding micronutrients in the soil. There's some arguments that it's killing soil microbes. This issue can get very emotional. Um, a lot of people are in this, oh my God, glyphosate's killing the world point of view. I'm probably not quite there yet. You have to remember, I'm old enough now that I was around when uh, Carl Sachs wrote uh, Standing Room Only. Remember that book? It came out in the late 50s. The world population was going to get to 9 billion people, and at that point, we're going to be so crowded, we're going to have to stand shoulder to shoulder. That's all we can do. And some of us got a little worried about that. And then a gentleman I met from Northwest Iowa one day said, you know, I did the math on that. He said, I can park 9 billion people in Kasuth County, Iowa, and I got the whole rest of the planet to play with. <laughs> and I checked his math, and he was right. <laughs> Right after that, we came with uh, Silent Spring. Remember that? Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. It's an interesting book to read now, because now you're looking back. And I'll admit, I'll be the first one to admit, I can make a lot better decisions looking backwards than I can forwards. Okay, I'm a master at looking back at what I screwed up yesterday. The problem is, while you're looking back, what are you doing about tomorrow? You're probably screwing it up. And then uh, Paul Ehrlich came out with two. If you want an interesting wintertime read, read these books, read all the things they predicted, and figure out how accurate they were. So there's always somebody that, oh my God, this is going to kill us all. You know, we keep using glyphosate, we're all going to die. I don't know if it's related to glyphosate, but I can tell you with a fact that we all are going to die. That's the only certainty that we're born with. <laughs> and I'm 55, it's coming soon enough, I'm not going to spend much of my time worrying about those kinds of things. This is an emotional issue. Some people get very upset. Some people have gotten violent over these kinds of things. I think they're getting way too intense about it. Okay? So, I want to spend a little bit of time on what do we know, what have we seen, what have we been able to do that works. Okay? Without getting all hung up on whether we're destroying the world or not, just have we seen a problem? Is there anything we can do about it? Now, this interestingly came last week. I subscribed to Discover Magazine. There's days I wonder why. I can tell you why. Actually, a young lady came by in the dead of winter, in the dark, selling magazines so her school choir could go somewhere, and I have a soft spot for that. So I'm now getting this magazine. This is the cover. Crop Wars, How Activists Are Halting Genetically Modified Research in Europe, and Why They Say It's Too Late for America. I, I, it's too late for us? I mean, we're all still alive. Our life expectancy is growing every single day. So I'm not sure where they were headed for this, but these are activists. And activist is an interesting word. Have you ever thought about that? If you take three words, activist, patriot, and terrorist, what are the key differences between those? It's all perspective. Do you think a terrorist thinks he's a terrorist, or you think he's a, does he think he's a patriot? I grew up with an example of that. My father was a little bit radical, and he was Irish. Not that there's any connection there or anything. I don't want you to assume anything in that. But you'd hear the news talking about the IRA terrorists in Northern Ireland, but my dad always said the IRA patriots in Northern Ireland. It's an issue of perspective. So, you know, people believe in their cause. They get fervent about it. I actually, I'm okay with that. But actually do something that does good, not harm. And so you get into all these things. I mean, we can get all emotional about this. Let's just back up, what do we know? What do we know, what do we see, where are we going? I don't know why this popped up, but the urge to save humanity is almost always a false front for the urge to rule. That was H.L. Mencken. And you see that sometimes. You wonder if these people really want to save the world, if they wouldn't really, really wouldn't rather control it. So we're going to take the emotion out of it and look, what do we know, what can we see, what could you observe in your field, and what can you do about it? This is glyphosate. Now, 
this is the last time I'm going to show you one of these, okay? I'd like to show you 20 of them, but this is the last one. Glyphosate is an acid. Go back to high school, you react an acid with a base, you get what? A salt. And so what you use, the forms of glyphosate you use are a water-soluble salt. You have to put some surfactants in them because water-soluble salts don't go through waxes and oils, which you find on weed leaves. So you have to put some things in them to help them out, but it's, it's an acid, you react it with a base, you get a salt. Now from here on out, I'm going to take that great big thing I just showed you and it's just going to be a big G, okay? So any place you see a big G, you can mentally put that branch chain diagram back in there if you like, or you can just leave it as a big G, same thing. Two most common glyphosate salts that you use, isopropyl amine salt of glyphosate, potassium salt of glyphosate. These are the two most commonly used formulations. When you dissolve them in the water, they split or disassociate. And then you have a free glyphosate cation floating around that has the ability to grab other things. These are the salts we use for herbicide. Unfortunately, glyphosate can also make these salts. It can bind with about any metal out there. I could throw iron into this loop. I could throw magnesium in the loop. It does seem to prefer ones that have two positive charges. Now, the problem is, while these salts are fairly soluble and the glyphosate will be released, these salts are very insoluble and the glyphosate is now bound up. <coughs> any of you put uh, ammonium sulfate in your well water before you spray your glyphosate? The reason you do is to get the calciums, the magnesiums, the irons out of the water so they don't grab the glyphosate, because if they do, that glyphosate is no longer active as a herbicide. It's not going to kill your weeds. There's another side of this. When the glyphosate grabs a zinc or a manganese specifically, that micronutrient is now no longer available. And that's one of the fears that we're getting. Oh, we're, we're binding up all the micronutrients in the soil. We're eventually not going to be able to raise a crop. There's some, it's just like everything else. Part of what's going on and what people are upset about is accurate, and part of it's not. So I always say back up, go to common sense. What have you seen? So we want to look at that for a few minutes. There's an argument that glyphosate's tying up micronutrients. You can call it chelation. You can call it complexing. That's just the difference in the number of bonds. If it's two bonds, it's a complex. If it's three bonds, it's chelate. You don't care. What you care is that if your manganese or your iron or your zinc or whatever gets stuck inside the glyphosate, you can't have it, at least for the time being. And so that can trigger a nutrient deficiency in your crop. So, what do we know about glyphosate? <laughs> Most people accept that the half-life in the soil is between 40 and 60 days. The studies have reported that it's between 3 and 140 days. The thing of it is, even if the glyphosate binds up a micronutrient, unless the glyphosate lasts forever, it's not going to bind that micronutrient forever. The glyphosate breaks down. The primary path in its breakdown is microbial. One of the things, when you have a microbial degradation, the soil tends to build up the microbes that break it down. Anybody, some of you guys that share as much gray hair as I do, you remember furidan? Sutan? Eradicane, Eptam, those were all thiocarbamate herbicides, and in one was an insecticide. They were broken down in the soil by a little critter called a thiobacillus. One of the problems they had was if you used them too many years in a row, you build up a level of that bacteria in the soil, and they broke down too quickly, and they wouldn't work. Now, since Roundup doesn't have any, or excuse me, glyphosate doesn't have any uh, soil activity, we won't see that. But the idea that we're building up higher and higher levels of glyphosate in the ground really doesn't make any sense. If it's microbially degraded, it should go down over time. Because the more we use, the more microbes will be in the soil to break it down. I'm also a great believer that we don't actually get ahead of Mother Nature. She tends to win and sometimes we tie, but we very seldom defeat her. You know, the idea that we're going to eradicate some microbe in the soil they don't. They change and they come back at us. So I'm really not too concerned about that. So I don't really think we're seeing an additive situation going on here. Other knowns. Well, Roundup Ready soybeans hit the market in what, 94, 95? Roundup Ready corn came sometime after that. How many acres in the Midwest have had extremely high use rates of glyphosate in the last 15, 18 years? How many of those produced uh, really, really high yields when it rains? I mean, 
And last year, as far as soybean yields, did you see some of those yields flashing by on the screen before the first presentation this morning? There was a lot of fields that have had a lot of glyphosate on kicking out 65 to 75 bushel beans this year. So the other thing I look at is my phone's not ringing. What we do, we spend the bulk of our summer going to a field because something's not right. I've been doing this for 35 years. You know how many times I've been called to look at a cornfield or a bean field because it looks so good they wanted to show it off? <laughs> Once. And that was in 2008. The guy said, you got to come look at my field. And I said, why? And he said, nothing. It just looks that good. I've never seen one like this. I'm like, I'm coming. I've been waiting for this call since 1978. <laughs> in my career, have I been called to a field where I felt that overuse of glyphosate was causing major production problems? The answer is no, I haven't. And I would think if it's happening that often, I probably would have had a chance to look at it. So let's just go back and look at what we can do and what we can't do. The first thing is when you get into chemical reactions, they have to balance. It takes so much of this reactant plus so much of that reactant to make so much of X. What you're doing is you're creating an insoluble, unavailable salt of one of these metals. You're going to create a manganese glyphosate salt, of iron glyphosate salt, glyphosate salt, excuse me. And that's no longer soluble, it's no longer mobile, it's no longer available to your crop. You have to do the math. That equation has to balance. If you put on a quart per acre of a 41% isopropylamine glyphosate solution, which is one of the more common formulations out there, a lot of them are 41, 42% IPA solutions, that can, bound, that can only bind a quarter of a pound of manganese per acre. Or take your pick, 17 hundredths of a pound of calcium, a tenth of a pound of magnesium, 24 pounds, 0.24 pounds of iron, excuse me, or 0.28. It can't do all of this, it can do one or the other. Okay, so it's not like we're sucking up all the metal in the ground, we're sucking up part of it. Okay. Now, have we seen that trigger problems? On occasion, we have. For the most part, no, but on occasion, we have. And this is some of the data, this is Dr. Rem in Minnesota. This was uh, the impact of banded manganese sulfate in the row on Roundup Ready beans. Where they put on none, they got 45 bushels. Where they put on 10 pounds of manganese in the row, they got 61. You'll notice 10, 20, and 40 were all about the same. Once you had enough, you were fine. Second one I want to look at. This is uh, Dr. Lamond and a couple other guys at uh, Kansas State. This was probably the study that triggered most of us to start looking at this. You've got a non-roundup situation, then you've got a roundup ready situation. This is the impact of manganese broadcast. Zero, two and a half, five, and seven and a half pounds per acre. And again, the non-roundup situation didn't really change at all. The roundup situation responded initially, hit about right here, and then after about five pounds per acre, nothing happened. So it's not really tying up all the manganese, it's tying up some. Once you get enough out there to compensate, now you're covered. And so the way this actually works, you put roundup on a roundup ready bean, it doesn't die. Excuse me, glyphosate on a roundup ready bean doesn't have to be round up, there's other forms. Why doesn't that bean die? Well, there's about three different things that can happen. One of them is it doesn't get into the bean at all. The second one is that it gets into the bean and the bean can detoxify it. Or the third one is it gets into the bean and it dumps it out just as fast. That's the way it works with a Roundup Ready bean. You put glyphosate on the bean, it basically takes the bean down to the root system and dumps it out pretty much in the same shape that it was in when it got there. So it doesn't actually ever enter into a reaction in the bean, therefore it can't cause a problem. The problem happens when you've got glyphosate coming out of the root and you've got manganese trying to come in, or iron trying to come in, or calcium trying to come in. But again, it's a balance. If you have a good level of manganese in the soil, there's a, quite a bit of it coming in, the Roundup may pick some off, but you may never pick up a deficiency. And so when you look at that, you have to have a trigger, you have to have some way to measure this. And so we're always looking for some quick and easy way to indicate do we have a problem or not. They always talk about hidden hunger, and, and in some cases that's true, but in a lot of micronutrients you don't really have hidden hunger. You have hunger you can see, and that costs you yield. Okay? So you need an indicator, you need to be able to compare an A to a B. And as we dig through these things, you have to recognize what you can you see and what can't you see. Okay? And the way we play this is you have to give yourself a reference. Let me 
reach down here. I got a visual aid hiding in here. Anybody in the room colorblind? Okay, I have I actually have four clients that are colorblind, can't see green from gray. If you farm for a living, that's a significant occupational problem. You're out there looking the field and say, well, this looks pretty good. And we said, we better tell me because it's all gray to me. Okay, so everybody can see green, right? This is green. Okay, no arguments with that so far. Now, if you walk into your soybean field in the summer after you sprayed glyphosate on it and they're this color green, are you in a good mood or a bad mood? Most guys say, yeah, not too bad. Are you sure? This green looks better than that green, doesn't it? What about this one? Hmm. Now I need to volunteer, and since you're obviously paying attention, can you help me? <laughs> I'll be nice, I promise. Take this, hold it over against that wall, and turn it around when I tell you to, okay? Yeah, but then flip it when I tell you, okay? Okay, can you see mine? Turn yours over. Which one's which? <laughs> it just got a lot harder, didn't it? <laughs> you can see, thank you, you can see subtle changes in green if what? They're right next to each other. If the whole field's like this, you might not notice there's a problem. So you always got to create reference points where you get that A-B comparison in your own field. We do this with nitrogen and corn, we do it with sulfur and beans, we do it with micronutrients following a, a glyphosate application. What you need to know is, as the glyphosate went down through the bean, comes out the bottom, did it tie up enough manganese to create a deficiency or was there enough manganese coming in from the soil that it didn't matter? It's only going to tie up so much, once it's tied that up, the rest of it's free to come and go as it pleases. So you look for areas where this is more likely to happen. With manganese, you look for lighter soils, lower organic matter. You also look for severely, or not severely elevated pH, just normally elevated pH, six nines and sevens and up. You're more likely to have a manganese problem. Because as a pH climbs, the manganese goes down. But you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to balance. If there's enough manganese coming into the plant that even though you put some Roundup on it, it tied some up, and it will, you know, glyphosate can tie up metals. That's one of those chemical things that I have trouble arguing with. It can. If glyphosate couldn't tie up metals, you wouldn't have to worry about having hard water because it's the metals in the water that are giving you the trouble, the calcium, magnesiums, and irons. So it can. That's just, that's a reality of the product. There are no perfect solutions. You ever notice that? Have you ever heard of a drug that might save millions of lives that did not have side effects? You know, this is not a, a risk-free existence. Many times we have to balance some risk to the environment to tackle the bigger issue of hunger, okay? And I, I don't really worry about the planet. Planet's been here four and a half billion years. How many species have come and gone? I don't think the planet's going anywhere. We might be screwed, but the planet's probably fine. <laughs> but you know, I. I remember asking my dad one day, how's it going? I, he said, well, I got bad news and good news. I said, what's the bad news? He says, well, the bad news is we're completely screwed. Okay, what's the good news? He said, well, it can't get any worse. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned that actually being monumentally screwed is very liberating, because at that point, you can't get any worse. You might as well just fix the problems you got and go on. So that's what we do. So these are beans that have a problem. Most of this bean plant is nice and dark green, but the new growth up above is pale. It's turning yellow, it's showing the veins are green, the intervenal tissue is turning yellow, it's showing classic chlorosis. Now unfortunately classic chlorosis from iron and classic chlorosis from manganese are very hard to tell in the field. You don't always get this brilliant of an indicator. The one thing I'll tell you is when you do trigger it, it usually shows in the upper growth earliest. Okay. Manganese in the plant is immobile. The plant can't take manganese from the old leaves and deliver it to the new leaves, so if you're going to see a deficiency, you're going to see it in the new leaves. And so what we'll see, if we, if we hit one of those moments where we actually triggered a problem, we'll see the upper growth of the plant 
being a little slow to green up. And sometimes it won't green up at all. In this case, it really didn't green up till we intervened and fixed it. So this is the upper leaves. The lower leaves look fine. The lower leaves just look dandy. But the upper leaves, as we, and it's the leaves that we were trying to grow, that we're trying to mature right after we applied the material. That's where we usually trigger the problem. Because up until then, the plant was getting enough manganese. At that moment, we triggered a temporary deficiency by applying a glyphosate. So when you see this, this one's an obvious one. I mean, you can be going by this field rather quickly on a gravel road, raising a rather large cloud of dust, and you can still see there's a problem. The problem is there's times when you can make money by fixing this where it's not nearly that visible. And so what we'll do in that situation is we'll come back to put in a reference strip. Give yourself that A-B comparison side by side in the same field. So how do you manage this situation, manganese and Roundup Ready beans? It's not happening everywhere. There are people that would tell you every time you spray Roundup, you ought to wait seven to 10 days and apply manganese. We've tried it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't always trigger a deficiency. If there's adequate manganese moving into the plant on good soils, you may not have a problem. If your soils are elevated pHs, six nines and above, it's more likely. If your soils are extremely dry, it's more likely. Nothing affects nutrient mobility and availability in the soil like moisture. There's all kinds of soils that have excellent nutrients until you dry them out and then they have real big problems, okay? I'm not worried about long-term additive effect of this. Some people say, well, once those things are bound up, they're bound up forever because Roundup's last them ridiculously long. The data says it's not, okay? And it's kind of interesting right now. There's all kinds of anti-glyphosate data coming out of Europe and very little of it coming over here. I don't know why. I know the Europeans, probably because of some history they had back in the 40s, have a little bit of problem with the whole genetic engineering thing. I can understand that. If I lived over there, I probably would too. I tend to just back away and say, what makes sense? And uh, I, I was on, getting ready for this talk, I was on some of the different blogs. And, and if you want to study humanity, start banging on web blogs. There's people there that I think they went off their medication. <laughs> but the one I love is none of this is being reported over here because all these big companies bought off all these government officials, huge conspiracy, blah, blah, blah. I don't really swallow massive conspiracy theories. We have a government that can't keep critical defense secrets off the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> and you're going to tell me they're going to execute a multi-billion dollar mass conspiracy to hide all the truth from us. Um, I have trouble with that. I do buy into Ben Franklin's theory of security. The only way two people can keep a secret is if the second one's dead. <laughs> and there's no way you can have that big a conspiracy without a whole lot of people knowing about it. With all the stuff going on lately, I did pop onto a quote of Ben Franklin's that really, I hadn't heard it before and it really turned my head. He said, democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what's for lunch. <laughs> and liberty is a well-armed lamb contesting the outcome. I'd, I'd, I'd never heard that, but it really caught me. You know. So what do you do? Leave a small check, leave a small overlap. This isn't hard. You're going across the field with your sprayer, kick over three rows. Now do it in a clean part of the field because your three row check can become three row weeds. That doesn't really help. So try not to do it in the weediest part of the field, but just kick it over. If the beans show a color change, if you can tell the difference between no glyphosate, normal rate, and a 2x rate, I would probably invest some money to go back in and apply a foliar manganese. Because if you can actually see a change, now your odds start to climb that you're gonna get a benefit. If, no, if they all look the same, I'm going to tell you, you've got more important troubles to chase than that, okay? You've got to have a reason to be there. You only have so many days, so much time, so, many money, so much money. Your sprayer can only cover so many acres in a day. Which acre does it need to be on today? And so put an indicator out there. Now, if you want to, you can do head-to-head -head leaf tests in these, too. Because if you trigger a deficiency, it may not be manganese. It may be iron, okay? Glyphosate can bind can bind to uh, iron the same as it can bind to manganese. It can bind to copper. It's really not that selective. We usually see manganese because manganese is more likely the one we're going to be deficient on. Generally, most of your soils are very abundant in iron. And if you don't have a, enough iron, it's strictly a pH issue. So if you're going to do head-to-head -head leaf tests, you're going to, on the same day, you're going to leaf test the single rate, the check, and the double rate. 
And if you're looking for manganese, I would test lower leaves on the beans and upper leaves on the beans because the upper leaves will show the deficiency much sooner than the lower leaves will. Um, by the time you go through all that rigmarole, it might be easier just to go out and spray some foliar manganese and see if it gets better. Okay? Because if you do, if you see a problem, if your beans are turning a little bit pale in your 2x rate or your 1x rate, and if it truly is manganese, when you put some on, it should get better. You should see them darken up. And if they don't, you might want to try something else. One of the downsides of 12 and 13 and 14 dollar beans is there's no small mistakes anymore, is there? You do a five bushel hickey and all of a sudden you're out 50, 60 bucks an acre. So if one, you know, try something. Remember, beans are indeterminate, so too late is a lot later in soybeans than it is in corn. You know, beans can drop 10 bushels this week and put them back on next week. If they ever develop a corn plant that can do that, we will raise 15 billion bushels. So you can do this if you want, but while you're doing this, go ahead and take a sprayer out there and spray some manganese, because that's, that's your most likely culprit. And if, you know, three or four days after you spray the manganese, if you can see those beans look better, keep right on going, okay? This is all we're talking about. You're out there spraying 90 foot swath. On this one here, we just kicked over a little bit. So now we've got a three or four row check, and over here we've got a three or four row strip of a 2x rate. And then, Remember, your eye can make that A-B comparison if they're close together. If they're not close together, it's a bigger problem, okay? So, manganese and Roundup Pretty soybeans, these are the critical roles of manganese in the plant. The things that you need to know is that it's fairly immobile in the soil. And so, if you have glyphosate coming out through the root and it's binding up the manganese, manganese can't move in from a further distance away. So you've just got, it's like a bottleneck. You got too many ships trying to come into port, it's the same time too many ships are trying to come out. Okay, if you got a whole lot more coming in than going out, you'll get enough in anyway. Okay, questions on that in particular? Um, I've got a couple different other areas I want to talk about, some other induced deficiencies, but I started out with that one because that's the one we're seeing the most. Yes, sir, right here. The question is, what about putting it in with the Roundup? The problem is, if that manganese is free, it will bind the Roundup in the tank and you may actually be deactivating your herbicide, okay? If you, if you put ammonium sulfate in there to get rid of the calcium, magnesium, and iron out of your water and then you put manganese back in, you kind of just undid what you did. Um, there's arguments about this. We're looking at probably seven to nine days after the Roundup goes on. And again, part of that is we want to wait and see if something changed. There's a whole lot of fields getting glyphosate put on in soybeans, and absolutely nothing negative is happening. Okay, as far as yield, maybe there's some, there's a lot of stuff about what it's doing to the nutritional quality and all that stuff. I'm pretty sure most of us have been eating Roundup Ready crops for 15 years, and we're all still here, and our life expectancy is still going up, and you know, the whole problem with Social Security is we're living too long. I mean, that's really, what it is. yes, sir? What's the difference in the salt base of potassium versus the isopropyl? Concentration. The, the question was, is there a difference well, on between, the on the Roundup, it does it matter if you use a potassium salt, the glyphosate, or the isopropyl amine salt? No, because once they dissolve in the water, once that glyphosate is off on its own, it doesn't matter who it used to be married to, it's a free agent. Okay, so it doesn't change whether they bind up nutrients less or more. Okay, the advantage of the potassium salts is that you can actually get a higher concentration of glyphosate in the solution. <laughs> So your potassium salts might be 51, 53 percent. Your isopropyl amine salts are usually 41 or 42. So you can get a higher amount of active ingredient in the same gallon. Is that why the jug's heavier? The, I don't know. I, I don't know if the density is different or not, whether the jug's heavier or not. Um, we use a boron solution quite frequently that weighs uh, 11 point something pounds per gallon, and they put it in five gallon buckets. That's one place where a two by two and a half would have been a much better choice. Uh, other questions on that? What's my time like? 17 minutes left. 17 minutes left. Yes, sir. Now, I wasn't going to get into the heavy chemistry, so I'm blaming this on you, okay? <laughs> there are things that are called liquid ammonium sulfate. There are things that are called ammonium sulfate substitutes. You have to look at the formula. If it doesn't contain actual ammonium sulfate, it can't do what ammonium sulfate does. When you add ammonium sulfate to a solution, 
to spray a glyphosate with, you need to do two things. The ammonium ion helps the glyphosate penetrate the wax and the oil on the leaf. Glyphosate without a surfactant stops at the leaf and goes nowhere. And if it doesn't go into the leaf, it doesn't work. The sulfate ion ties up calcium, magnesium, iron, potentially manganese. That's why it's there. That's why we recommend if you're using AMS, put your AMS in the nurse tank, then pump the water to the sprayer. Because if, if you need AMS and it's actually working, you're going to get some stuff out of that water. You're going to get some magnesium sulfate crystals or some sulf calcium sulfate crystals or some ferric sulfate crystals. You would rather deal with those problems in your nurse tank than in your sprayer. Uh, we also recommend that the AMS always goes in ahead of the glyphosate for the same reason. You want to bind up the bad guys before you let the good guys into the ring. Okay. Other quick questions on that? Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Back to manganese. Does it matter if it's chelated? Will it still tie up Roundup if you use a chelated manganese? What the chelation does is it delays it, but it doesn't prevent it. Um, in most cases with Roundup, we've got to go foliar. I mean, soil applied, if you put a bunch out there, you, you saw some of the data they put on uh, 20 pounds of manganese sulfate in a row. That's okay, but that's probably going to cost you 40, 50 bucks an acre. And so a little bit foliar, remember the problem's at the bottom of the plant, the foliar's coming in through the top. I was referring to you, if you put it in chelate with your Roundup and spraying it foliar at the same time as you do your Roundup. That might work as long as the chelating agent is strong enough to fight off the glyphosate. And that's, you know, there's all kinds of different strengths in chelating agents. Some of them are extremely weak, some of them are extremely uh, tough. Chelating manganese in and of itself is kind of tricky. It's not one that works well. It has, it's hard. Manganese is tough at everything we do. There's a lot of fields I know I'm manganese deficient. I've been trying for 20 years to fix them. I haven't gotten it done yet. Because the soil, some soils just kind of grab it up and it's gone. And then we aggra aggravate that by throwing a glyphosate out there. Okay. Other questions on that? Okay, well, let's go on to one other induced nutrient deficiency. Let's talk about sulfur. There's all kinds of arguments why we're having more sulfur deficiencies. I really think the fact that we had five years or four years of extremely wet weather was part of it. There's also an argument that the EPA's cleaned up the coal-fired power plants. They have. Not that many coal-fired power plants are running that hard right now because in a bizarre twist of events, it's actually cheaper to make electricity with natural gas right now than it is with coal. So we're not getting as much sulfur out of the air. In some places, our soil organic matter has actually dropped. The other problem with sulfur is the only form that's available is extremely mobile. Once you get sulfur in the soil to a form where the soybean can use it, it takes very little rain to flush it out the bottom. Because it's a double negative charge, it tends to repel the soil. And so all these things going on, we're making more money applying sulfur to soils that we didn't think we needed sulfur for. Now with soybeans, it's a little less touchy because <coughs> soybeans can be deficient early and still make an awfully good yield. Okay, as opposed to corn, if it's deficient early, it gives up bushels you cannot get back. So when we look at sulfur deficiency in corn, sometimes it's being induced by heavy rain, sometimes it's being induced by low organic matter. We know that if we put sulfate on in the spring on soybeans, especially lighter soils or in an area where you've had a lot of heavy rain, and the definition of heavy rain is how much rain have you had since the last time the soil was warm. In most of your good soils, the bulk of the sulfur is actually in the organic matter. And when the soil's warm, the organic matter mineralizes, that releases free sulfate, which is available, but now it's also mobile. So you get a year like this year, so far we had a warm fall on your better soils in Illinois, you should be fine on sulfate right now. But if you happen to drop 15 inches of water through the system during March, you may not be. Then it comes down to when does the ground warm up and how soon do you get it back in the game. In a lot of springs where I live, I, I live in Iowa, it's not above the Arctic Circle, but we can see it from there. <laughs> you know, we'll be out, we'll have soils that won't hit the middle 60s till Memorial Day a lot of years. And real good mineralization of nutrients out of organic matter really seems to kick off when the soils hit the middle 60s. You know, a lot of times you got a crop out there, it's 55 degrees, it's cold, it's raining, your corn's yellow and slow, your beans yellow and slow, and then all of a sudden it just takes off. And people say, oh, it got a hold of the nitrogen, or this happened, or that happened. Usually what happened is the ground warmed up. 
Now you have to think about planting dates too. When did you plant soybeans this year? April. April. Any March beans in the room? There's probably one guy and he says, I'm not putting my hand up. <laughs> when did your grandfather plant soybeans? Middle, late May, Memorial Day. Do you think the environment that bean was living in, going in the ground on May 20th, is a little different than the environment you put it in? And after you talk about soil moisture effect and nutrient availability, number two is temperature. There are lots of things that are readily available in a nice prairie silt loam when it's 65 degrees that are not available when it's 50. Okay, so you have to, with beans it's a little trickier. Just managing early nutrient deficiencies, making beans grow bigger, doesn't always help you. Uh, the opposite is true with corn. Corn, if you manage early nutrient deficiencies, it almost always pays. So you've got to go through all these things, and if you've got lighter soils, timber clays, or sand, you probably have a sulfur problem that lasts all season long. If you've got a drummer Flanagan in McLean County, Illinois, the year you have a sulfur problem is the year you've had a lot of heavy rain since fall, and it takes a while for the ground to warm up. You know, last year we hit the 70 degree soil mark in Iowa in March. In my career, that's the first time we've done that. So we saw less issues with things like sulfur, nutrients that we can get out of organic matter. But if you've got a 1.5% organic matter timber soil, you very likely could have a sulfur problem all season long. Okay. So again, this is another one that you've got to understand if the field's deficient, you have to understand why. Does it just not have enough? Or is what's out there is not getting in the game? Again, whoops, wrong button, John. At any given moment, the, the vast proportion of the sulfur in the soil is in the organic matter. Now, when the ground's up in the middle 60s and above, you've got it mineralizing out all the time. When you're breaking down residue, you're mobilizing it back. This process requires warm soils, and down around 50 degrees, it's all but stopped. Okay? So when you plant early in better soils, you may have a short-term nutrient deficiency, especially with a mobile nutrient like sulfur. We have the same issue with boron. The bulk of the boron's coming out of the organic matter, whoops, but it also is extremely water soluble and mobile once it releases. So, you know, right now, last fall, you had a warm fall, you release sulfate, you release boron out of your organic matter. So far, we haven't drenched it, we haven't dumped a bunch of heavy rain. We had bigger responses from these nutrients in better soils in 08, 09, and 10, and, and also 2011, because we had extremely heavy rain between warm soil in the fall and warm soil in the spring. And so we had some early deficiencies on the poor soils. We had that deficiency problem all season long. So when you start looking at these nutrients, you've got to look at which one, why are you deficient? In many cases, it's not that there's not enough in the soil. It's because for one reason or another, the soil won't give it to you when you need it. Okay? So, and, and unfortunately for a lot of these, soil tests are not that helpful. The sulfate soil test is pretty good until it rains. Okay? The boron soil test is pretty good until it rains. And so you need to kind of read your environment, use a little bit of judgment, create those reference strips, and then you can see what you need to do. And I think I've got, what, five left? Is that correct? Three. Three. <laughs> All right, any, any questions on this or anything I didn't cover? The floor is open. Anything you want to ask about, we'll take a shot at. Yes, sir? When we go to spray, Okay, the question was, when you go to spray your glyphosate, should you be thinking about status and micronutrient deficiencies as opposed to just timing and weed size? I would stick with timing and weed size. Your, your biggest threat to your yield still is going to be controlling the weeds and doing it on a timely basis. So I would time it based on that and then watch. If you're earlier, you know, if you trigger an early micronutrient deficient, like an early manganese, it may grow out of it. And depending on this timing, you may not have a yield reduction. Again, beans can dump 10 bushels this week and put it back on next. So I would, I would f if it was me, and I'm not sure this is the right answer, but it's the best one I have today, I would focus on me getting the weed control done right. Okay. Other quick questions? Yes, sir. I had two times when uh, I was corn bean rotation, 55 bushel beans. I had some alfalfa fields uh, one year. 
seven year alfalfa. Killed it in the fall, no tilled my beans in, 70 bushel. The next time I had a six year alfalfa field, killed the alfalfa, no tilled the beans in, 70 bushel beans. What's going on? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I think there's about seven questions hiding in those two sentences. Okay, you had seven-year alfalfa, killed it, planted beans, and you got 70 bushel. 70 bushel. And you had six-year alfalfa, killed it, planted beans, and got 70 bushel, 70 bushel beans. But in your corn bean rotation, you're hanging around about 55. Right. I would look at two areas. The first one is late season nitrogen. Okay. When you have alfalfa out there for a lot of years, you tend to build a lot of organic matter nitrogen and that can come in late in the season. We've had excellent luck putting late nitrogen on soybeans, but it's R3.5 to R4 soybeans. Most of the time in today's world, if we do it, it's through an irrigator. We used to do it in 30-inch beans, but then everybody went 15s or started drilling. As Ken said this morning, if you were listening to his talk, beans only fix about half what they need, and they do a better job of fixing on the front end. When that bean plant starts to mature and it's really into heavy pod filling, if you can give it supplemental in, that can help it. That's one possible one. The, the one, probably the more likely one I'd look at would be anthracnose. Because there's anthracnose, anthracnose is like a, a planet. It's like the human race. How many different variants of the human race are they? Well, there's more variants of anthracnose. And you can have anthracnose in alfalfa, you can have anthracnose in beans, but many times it's not the same one. And I've been looking at this, the yield bump we talk about, if you go two years of corn, you pick up four or five bushels. If you go three years of corn, you pick up another four or five. Where a lot of that's coming back in our mind is anthracnose, because one year away from beans is not breaking the anthracnose cycle. And in some fields, because of all the change to corn after corn and all this, we're looking at bean fields that were half one year corn after soybeans, and the other half is two or three year corn after soybeans, or soybeans after corn, pardon me. And we can see right to the line the beans change color when it's the same variety, and it's because there's not as much of that darkening of the stem you get from the anthracnose. And so, the other possibility that I can think of right now would be that your alfalfa broke the anthracnose cycle and that let those beans flourish. That'd be two places to look. That doesn't mean it's right. That's just two things that I'd look at first. Okay. The nitrogen one, if you can figure out a way to get some late nitrogen on, that'd be an easy one to check. But I think that's, we get some very good bean yields following long-term hog manure. And I think it's late season nitrogen. If you give beans too much nitrogen early, they get lazy, and a lot of times you'll depress yields. But if you can give them nitrogen about R3.5, R4, you know, with us on our irrigated beans, that's a given. We hit R3.5, R4, that field's going to get 50 to 60 pounds a hen. Because that's usually five to eight bushels like clockwork. Okay? Now, if I could find a way to do it in a commercial bean field that's not irrigated, we'd try it. But flying on dry nitrogen that time of year, it's 50 50 whether you're going to get a rain. Then you try and put it on early because you're afraid you're not going to get a rain, and then you get a rain right away, and now all of a sudden your beans are this high, and they're green as can be, and they look gorgeous, but there's not much out there. So, good questions. Any uh, other quick ones? Yes, sir? You doing any work with cover crops and, and beans? Not, we're, doing, we're doing some work with cover crops, and I was a little slow to the table on the cover crop thing. I'm looking at cover crops for totally different reasons than most people are. You know, we played with tillage radishes and basically they went down to the hard layer we were trying to break and they stopped just like everything else did. And so now I got 25 bucks an acre in tillage radishes out there. They went right down to my hard pan and quit. I'm pretty sure I could have fixed that with a ripper. Because I could have picked the day and the point size and the speed and the depth and the spacing. I could have changed all those variables. When you go to tillage radish, you can't control much of what happens the day after you spray it or the next two months after you spray it. Um, there's a lot of things that cover crops do. I, I tend to look at them, they're a tool. Cover crop is no different to me than a wrench or a chainsaw. The day that it's the right tool for the job and the most economic tool for the job, they're gonna make you money. Now where my interest in cover crops coming back to is from a standpoint of biodiversity. If we're weak in an area right now, probably the area I'd say we're weakest in is soil microbiology. There are countless organisms in the soil that do something very important to us, for us as far as raising a crop, and we haven't even identified them yet. We don't even know they're there. Even less, what do they eat, and could we, are we making their life better or worse? If you want to understand how important soil micro life can be, if you've ever seen fallow syndrome in corn or wheat, you can have a plant that's sitting there in a soil with an excellent phosphorus soil test, and that plant's getting absolutely no phosphorus at all because the microbes that release the phosphorus are gone. Now, it usually happens after a flood or extensive summer fallow will do that too. When we 
put corn after corn or soybeans after soybeans or nothing but corn and soybeans. My question is, are there microbes in the soil that don't eat corn stalks or can't eat soybean stubble? And are we losing them? So I'm, my interest in cover crops is mostly in a, in a two crop culture or a one crop culture, are we, can we introduce a new type of residue and maybe maintain some of that biodiversity? Now, we've got a title for that book. We've almost finished the foreword. That's how far along we are. So when you're looking at cover crops, first of all decide, okay, I'm putting a cover crop in there for a specific reason. What am I trying to accomplish and what are the other ways I can do that? Yes, cover crops can scavenge nitrogen, so can corn stalks. Um, so I wouldn't put a sc nitrogen scavenging cover crop onto corn stalks in the fall, but I might on soybeans because soybean stubble doesn't scavenge as much nitrogen when it breaks down. I mean, we're, you're out there to mobilize the end so it stays put. There's a lot of ways to do that. So always look at what's your alternative tool, but think about cover crops from a standpoint of biodiversity because we've seen some yield bumps with tillage radishes where they went right down to the hard layer and stopped but we still got a yield bump. And I'm not sure why, but one possibility is, okay, that's a totally different type of residue. Are we feeding a group of microbes that's in trouble? If you think about it from a very simplistic point of view, and I tend to do everything from a very simplistic point of view, that's really all my brain can handle. If you've got a lot, and in that lot you've got livestock, you've got 25 lambs and you've got 25 horses and you've got 25 pigs and 25 cows. For the next 10 years, you don't put anything out there but lamb feed is that population going to shift? And that's one of my questions. When you go from a prairie environment, you're thinking all grass, but it wasn't all grass, was it? There was all kinds of diversity in a prairie. And now we're down to basically one or two types of plant residue, and it is a little bit of a concern that we're not feeding everything we need to keep that soil as active and doing everything that we need it to do. As far as maintaining organic matter, I think we can do that without a cover crop in a, if we put enough high carbon residue out there. But then the question is, even though our organic matter is holding up, is there some population of microbes that we're losing because we're not feeding them? So that's, that's currently the way we're looking at the cover crop situation. Okay? Just make sure you decide what is it you're trying to do. You're trying to control erosion, you're trying to build organic matter, you're trying to uh, scavenge nitrogen, you're trying to break compaction. And then what's your next alternative? If I didn't use a cover crop to solve that problem, how would I do it? And then just do a balancing act. Which one is most likely to do it for the least amount of money? Okay? Any last questions? I think I'm actually over time now. Thank you for coming. Thanks to the association for inviting me down. I hope the last uh, 45 minutes was time well spent for you. And uh, take care. <laughs>